Good afternoon. I almost said good morning because for me right now, recording it's morning. But I realize it's afternoon. It's late in the afternoon. I'm the last talk on the last day. So um, I decided to try to keep your attention and enthusiasm for staying to the last of this talk. I'd show one of our last slides first, and that's uh, here where we show uh, field uh, delivery of some of what I'll be talking about today and their impact on citrus growth um, at our research farm. So you'll see the under the red uh, line uh, that indicates treated. We have two trees that received one of our treatments that I'll be describing today, followed by the uh, two control trees on either side. So we have some strategies that are that are looking promising and we're really excited about. Uh, so today, with that said, then I'm talking about advances in therapeutic for citrus HLB control, discovery and delivery. So this is really not um, anything new. It's something that's grown out of 10 years of research and multiple need for grants that have really supported this work along the way um, and the strong collaboration and teamwork we've built to make this happen. And that's what um, I'll be describing today, focused on one aspect of what is our new, excuse me while I switch to the next slide, our new <coughs> um, NEPA grant that was just awarded, we're in the first year, it's entitled Therapeutic Molecule Evaluation and Field Delivery Pipeline for Solutions to HLB. Again, this is a multi-institution nationwide project uh, for $15 million over five years. Um, and it, I, I want to stress now that it really grew out of team building strategies developed by ARS, one called the Grand Challenges, where we brought in and we were allowed to bring in ARS scientists from multi -air, multiple areas and uh, uh, come together uh, to help develop solutions and, and deliver expertise to the, in this case, citrus greening problem. Uh, also an ARS X prize award that allowed us to demonstrate proof of concept of a new strategy, the focus of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, we had a team um, that put together a competition strategy that was awarded for $100,000 to do that. And all of this work involves a very close creative relationship with AgriSource, uh, a company that can commercialize and deliver uh, what we'll be talking about. So today the focus is on a, a specific aspect of our new NEFA grant. This NEFA grant uh, is, has myself and Dr. Michelle Heck, USDA in Ithaca, New York as co-directors and Dr. Martin, uh, Marco Patino as a lead researcher and Kimberly Wood as a project coordinator. This represents the management team. We meet weekly and uh, to go over all aspects of the project, including just the pushing the paperwork for the NEFA reports, making sure we're on track, developing um, ways to, to get this information from all the participants, organizing the activities, coordinating teams. But we don't just meet weekly, the whole, weekly, the whole team meets weekly. And here's the core of the team. This is a large project. There are 79 team members, 22 primary researchers, 11 advisory board members that we've already met with, nine postdocs, 13 technicians, four graduate students, 20 undergraduates. This grant was the top rated grant in this round of the NEFA awards. And we were awarded a designation of center of excellence during the five-year project term of this, of this award. Okay. so. This project also involves so five states, right? We've got California, Florida, Georgia, New York, and Washington. I know we don't have a lot of citrus in New York and Washington, but we do have excellent researchers uh, with greenhouses and laboratories that are providing support, um, whether it's in the lab or model systems, um, but uh, crucial to the project. Uh, we have two research groves that involve with over 1500 trees of six different varieties. We have two growing regions as well as multiple growing regions across Florida in commercial growth, so primarily through the interaction with members of our advisory board. All right, that was a bit of a long induction for such a short talk, but I, I think I needed it. Um, here's the core of our project. This is, these are the list of the project object objectives for this next five years. And it goes all the way from um, identifying new molecules all the way through screening um, potential molecules in laboratory and greenhouse, moving to the field, understanding the best delivery strategy for commercial delivery of these projects and, and demonstrating their effectiveness in field tests. Now, the idea is under, right from the beginning, we're interacting um, with 
regulatory, economic, and extension outreach um, experts to really make sure that what we're delivering to you is a product that, that can make, make it commercially feasible to apply. Uh, you see under delivery, we have three different application um, strategies for any therapeutic molecules we discover. Novel delivery method, uh, that's what will be the focus of this talk today and um, show you some of our early preliminary field evaluations. Clearly transgenic delivery. So if, if the mo therapeutic molecules we identify are amenable to this, it is somewhat of the holy grail where we can hand off a, a resistant plant. And finally, direct delivery, classic delivery strategies that are uh, adapting currently used methods for getting molecules into the plant. Remember, from the delivery perspective, that really is one of the major hurdles because the bacteria that causes HLB lives in the foam. We got to get it inside the plant. We got to get it in there at a level that's acceptable to do the job. But today, we'll be talking about uh, one specific aspect. But before that, I want you to know that we are delivering across every point in this project objective list right now. We are starting at identifying molecules. We're doing that because we know we need multiple molecules. Um, even if we have one that works very well, we want to make sure it continues to work. So we want to be able to provide integrated pest management strategies where we're, we're um, able to rely on more than one control method to, to avoid the potential of developing resistance. But we have trees, we have molecules moving into screening strategies right on trees or on plant tissue in laboratory or greenhouse. We are evaluating all three of these delivery methods right now with certain molecules, and we're even in the field. And that's where I'll be focusing today on what we're doing in the field and specifically related to a novel delivery method. I wanted to introduce that publicly for the first time here in this talk today. So what do we mean by a novel delivery method? Well, this grew out of our need to develop a, a genetic engineering molecular strategy that we could deliver to trees in the field. We knew that classic genetic engineering of engineering a whole plant is, um, is really powerful, but it also has issues with um, the time it takes to go through the, the deregulation process, could get all of the regulatory data captured that's needed. Um, we wanted to be able to find a way to deliver genetic engineering solutions without uh, such an arduous regulatory process. And that's what this uh, project that we'll be describing today includes in a way that we can protect trees in the field. We call it FACT uh, solution, FACT, P-H-A-C-T, stands for plant host activated cell transplantation. Well, that's, I call it that because I'm a scientist, but basically what we're doing is creating host cell symbionts. Host, that's citrus, that's the host. But we take citrus cells and we allow, we engineer them so that they can grow without being regulated by the plant developmental signals. So as long as they're getting nutrients, they grow. And we get them to produce molecules that can, that can create pest or pathogen immunity in the plant. Now, this was an idea. We presented to ARS in their ARSX prize alert, but I've described that before, or I mean, their ARSX prize award strategy or competition. Um, we competed nationwide. Uh, they narrowed it down to 10 initially, and we went through a competition. And then um, from that, they picked three to award, and we were one of them. And this was a project with myself, Michelle Heck, and Marco Patino. And we awarded $1,000, $100,000 for proof of concept. Uh, we didn't do this in a vacuum. We did this, uh, again, we had uh, collaborating participants in this from University of Florida, <coughs> AgriSource. Of course, Marco Patino is with AgriSource and a company called Codex DNA, uh, a world authority in, in, in um, synthetic biology. So what is this strategy, this fact, this symbiont strategy? Well, it's something based on something that's been happening in nature for over a million years. Um, there's a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Uh, this Agrobacterium causes what's typically thought of as a, as a plant disease called crown gall disease, and it does so by taking, here's the bacteria right here. It has the ability to enter wound sites on a plant, snuggle up next to a plant cell, and when it's in close association, it can transfer this purple region, this tDNA that's on a small plasmid inside the bacteria. That tDNA gets, can be transferred into the plant cell. It migrates to the nucleus of the plant cell and incorporates 
in the plant cell chromosome. So it's there and now it's stably there. So uh, this is the basis of genetic engineering. In nature, this, what the bacteria does is, is it causes, the, the genes that it insert causes these cells to start growing because they produce their own plant growth regulators. And so they can grow no longer under the developmental signals of the plant and they form a ball. If you've ever been out looking at oak trees and you see a big old knot on the side of it, especially the ones down um, near the ground, you'll, th th that's typically a crown gall. Um, on big trees, when these happen, they typically do not cause a, a problem. It definitely is a problem if it happens in the nursery on really small trees and it's an aggressive strain of agro. Um, they can uh, mess up the vascular system and reduce the vigor and health of that tree. But um, there are many cases where when they form on plants in uh, larger plants in the field, they uh, have minimal impact on, on the, the growth and health of that tree. So uh, our question is, is, is if we could do this, could we then add genes that we want these cells to produce, these plant cells? Can we add them to this tDNA so that when the bacteria inserts it, they, in, they insert genes of interest? Well, of course we can. This is the basis for creating transgenic plants. They do this in the lab and then they get the cell to form a whole new plant, but they've gotten rid of the genes that cause this, this gall formation. We decided we want this to be formed, only we don't want to call it a gall anymore just to differentiate from pathogenic growth. We want to call it a symbiont because really we're adding cells from another plant. It is a citrus, but another plant. Um, and we're getting them to grow into this ball that is providing producing products that aid the tree. So it's a beneficial, we think uh, the word symbiont is, is better to distinguish it from pathogenesis. So we form symbionts through getting agrobacterium to deliver DNA we want to the plant. This ball grows on this trunk of the plant. It produces desirable molecules. So how do we do that? Well, we, we take agrobacterium and put the gene of interests that we want in into the tDNA, and then we use microneedles to inject the plant. Then we let those cells start to grow and they will, they'll grow form a, a mass of cells on the side of the tree. And then we do this in the greenhouse. We take it, we cut it off, we sterilize them. We put those cells in culture and we treat them so that we can kill off all the agrobacterium. It's only plant cells now. And um, we get rid of those cells that aren't activated. So all of these cells are now cells that are activated and producing the molecules that we want them to produce. And then we grow them in mass and now we can take them out and inoculate trees where they will grow into a, a symbiont. The symbiont will produce desirable molecules that can move out into the plant vascular system and move throughout the plant and impart a desired characteristic. So that's what we're doing. Um, we know that these structures are highly vasculated. Um, this is from old work. This is a diagram from um, tissue from, I believe it was from the 1980s, maybe the 90s. And um, so... Um, we know it's a great way to get molecules produced and move into the stem. And we've proven that, in fact, by um, showing here is a very early developing um, symbiont on the side of a plant. And you can see that it's got this green glow to it because we're shining a UV light on it that causes a protein that we're getting these symbionts to produce called the green fluorescent protein. Um, so the, uh, to, to produce it, accumulate it. And we can see it using a UV light that we see the green fluorescence of the GFP or green fluorescent protein. But you can also see that color, that fluorescence moving outside of the gall. And here it's in association with the cell walls of the neighboring cells, but it's moving into the vascular tissue. And we've shown that we can have systemic effects on plants depending on what we produce in these symbionts. Um, they can grow pretty quickly, especially in tomato. We do a lot of work in tomato because it has um, the ability to form these galls fairly quickly. So um, here's 10 days. We see a bump starting to form after these, these tomato plants have been inoculated. And then these are ones that, again, that are producing green fluorescent protein. If we look at these at, at 20 and 30 days after inoculation, we see a mass that will fluoresce green when a UV light is shined on it. The red is the chlorophyll from the plant that, that, that um, fluoresces green, uh, red rather, I'm sorry. And so then you see the green color from showing that these goals are accumulating a lot of the protein. Um, you can't see it moving from there because the red is, is overpowering the ability to see the green in the um, stem sections in these. 
So, so the idea is we form this, this mass of cells, the symbiont growing on the trunk and getting it to produce molecules. So what are the risks and assumptions about this strategy? Well, the idea, remember, is that the plant is not transgenic, just those cells. And those cells stay there. They don't move. Um, but the products that they make move into the plant. So, of course, there is a question, well, what about the residue? And we're addressing that because we're looking at ways of inducing natural defenses. So we're just um, producing inducers that move into the plant and turn on the plant's own natural defenses. So we're not producing defensive molecules directly. We're producing natural, or we are producing defense molecules in them that move systemically, but they're natural defense molecules that, that citrus can produce. Uh, we're also uh, looking at the use of inducible promoters so that if we do produce something, um, we can turn it on and off when we want. And we're looking at uh, the lifespan of that symbiont. Um, now, let's look at the idea of regulatory. Again, uh, a transgenic plant takes a long time to get to the growers uh, because of, of deregulation process where they ask a lot of data information about what, you're, what you've created um, because they know the whole plant is engineered. That means the fruit that you harvest, the flowers that the bees land on, everything is engineered. In ours, the only thing that's engineered is that, is that symbiont, that bump on the side of the plant. So um, the pollen's not engineered, right? The, the, the seeds aren't engineered. The fruit that you harvest are not engineered. Also, if those fall off, either by animals coming along, eating them or grabbing them and carrying them off, they will die. They need to be on that host to, to um, be able to attach. And the way we attach them to the host is not just slap them on the side of the tree. It requires some, some special handling and special delivery strategies. So even if they're carried by birds from one plant to another, um, they will not take. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. And then um, the bees, uh, clearly, since we don't have engineered pollen um, and we, depending on what we produce, we could produce plants that, that uh, are not producing anything that would be harmful to the bees. We especially don't have to spray. Um, so we know we're not using synthetic pesticides for this. And that's again, beneficial for the bees. And we could potentially be up to just one time application. All right, there's multiple components to this. I think if anybody look at it, it goes, wow, there's multiple steps here and there are, and we know that. And that's why we have a big team. We have expertise from many areas. We're looking at defense gene discovery and evolution evaluation. We're looking at symbiont structure and development. So we wanna make sure that these symbionts that form are, are good, healthy, proper structure and that they develop it in the right way. Um, we have experts in look, targeting the aspect of export, how to improve export of molecules from the symbionts. I think you saw that picture of those symbionts growing and glowing green. We know GFP, that gr green glowing protein is moving out, but a lot stays in and we're looking at ways to optimize that. We're looking at symbiont mass production. If we produce these host cells, these citrus cells, how do we produce them in mass and get them delivered to the growers so they can inoculate their trees? We're doing field evaluation. I showed you a, a picture of our preliminary work in the field right now, and I'll show you some more. And we're also doing this in the bubble of regulatory and commercial um, um, information that's needed. So, so constantly interacting with the industry so that we understand what data they need for regulatory approval and what data they need to show the best commercial strategy to do this. So this is all being done together with the idea of commercialization. Now I'm gonna show you a real quick video. Um, this is a tomato plant that, and we have a time-lapse video of inoculating these and over a period of, of two weeks, how those um, symbionts develop. We inoculate them and the symbionts try to start to grow out of the stem. In this case, you can see up to four different inoculation sites, and they were done with microneedles. So you see each cluster is from microneedle um, delivery. Uh, in the greenhouse, I've shown this before, I believe, but uh, our symbionts um, can be used to cure tree, trees sick with citrus green disease. We've seen, um, maybe cure is not the best word here, I would say definitely um, reduce and slow the symptoms in our greenhouse studies. Uh, we've gone a long way since then. So we're hoping that this will transfer to keeping trees healthy in the field. And I think we're, we're there as you'll see from our preliminary work. But the initial work showed that in Citron here, we were able to, when we delivered antimicrobial peptides 
via this symbiont strategy, we were able to get regrowth of healthy tissue as compared to controls, which remained um, growing, which remained HLB positive and growing. And we had to reduce titer in those trees too. So the, uh, and again, I wanna do, say that we can do this with a strategy in the greenhouse here that shows that we can treat existing trees. And um, remember that this tree, those leaves, those healthy leaves are not transgenic. So we're reducing our non-target exposure um, and we're delivering molecules that may be hard or costly to produce any other way. One of the problems with why biological molecules fail in commercial delivery is one, it's hard to get them to be taken up and survive for a long time on the plant. And number two, they're expensive to develop. But we've solved those problems here because we don't produce them. We let the plant produce them. So we don't have the expensive cost of, of producing them. And um, they're not topically applied. They're already inside the plant. So all the molecules we make are where they need to be to act. So um, I'd like to finish up with describing where we are with our field testing. Uh, we have, I will show you some preliminary work that we've done in our lab, but as part of this grant, Dr. Lorenzo Rossi from the University of Florida, right next door to us here in Fort Pierce at the Indian River Research and Education Center is uh, leading our field team evaluation group and um, all the information coming out of our molecule discovery pipeline work um, will be used to determine what molecules merit moving to the field. And when they do, then the main goal here is to do a multi-year field evaluation of our candidate therapeutics with their associated delivery strategy. And we'll work again with the regulatory group to make sure that what we do develops our data they need to move this forward and to continue to do economic analysis to make sure we're, we're presenting it in the best strategy we can economically for the growers. So uh, field testing, we'll be looking at, uh, aside from a course yield, that will be, you know, we all understand that's the real deal with, with if this is gonna have an impact or not, but we'll be looking at HLB symptoms and titers, net photosynthetic rate gas exchange, nutrient status of leaves and roots, root growth, development and density. Um, <coughs> this is an area of expertise of Dr. Rossi. He's a plant physiologist. And, uh, but we'll also be looking at effect on the Asian citrus psyllid population. And as I said, of course, yield. All right, so then I'll finish up by saying, um, what are we seeing in the field right now? Well, we have some preliminary um, experiments. They're very exciting because we've repl replicated them on multiple varieties, um, but we were initially setting this up as a quick screen for, for growth of our symbionts. Um, so we knew how to set up our trials when we were starting to look at molecule effectiveness. And, and lo and behold, um, we were showing that we actually had some, some really interesting work. Here's what the symbionts look about six months after inoculating a plant. So you see this bump growing on the side of the trunk of the tree. These are, uh, I believe, four-year-old trees that we have in our research park. Here's another one. This one is actually a year and a half old. And you can see on the right the picture of, of the um, symbiont on the side of the trunk. And if you look over here, these are the same trees in a row, just different angles, different lighting. So you can see this one right here that's bigger than the rest is the treated one that has that symbiont on it. And these are the controls. And this is a year and a half year old Valencia. Um, here is uh, an area of our uh, Hamlin um, block where we have uh, two symbiont treated trees uh, followed by a control tree and another symbiont treated. And I think, I hope you, these aren't the best pictures, but you could see major growth difference there, as well as in this picture here in another row where we have two symbiont tree trees surrounded by the control trees. Um, in, in, in another section of the Hamlin Grove, we really had some uh, flooding damage uh, as a right, result of bad storms a few years back. It was right after planting and the Hamlin suffered the worst on this. And we, we were trying to bring them back um, and they're coming back slowly. Uh, and we used the one, one section to look at the treatment. And again, here's a symbiont treated surrounded by two controls. And if you wanted to, you, if you squint real hard, you can see there's a symbiont growing on the side of this trunk. Um, again, other Valencias, uh, the two treated surrounded by controls. Um, Ray Ruby grapefruit. We got a treated tree surrounded by two controls and a symbiont treated uh, with the control trees beside it. So I know one of this, 
they said, if you, sometimes some people say, if you can get us to be able to grow grapefruit, we've got it covered because they're the most, most sensitive. So we're really excited about this finding that we, looks like we're having a positive impact on, on grapefruit. Uh, we also looked at honey beltangelos and saw something similar, a growth stimulus response. Um, and these trees were in the field for all of these, I showed you for three years, at least before treatment, they all had a titer of Liberobacter. Um, these pictures were taken just last week and now we're evaluating the titer in them once more. So, so it looks like we're having a positive effect. And we're really excited and we're using this information to now set up replicated studies that we can, that we can um, do further evaluation on. So uh, it's been a long road. We all know that it's been a difficult time for the growers since Green got here. And uh, we're very sensitive to the fact that the growers are saying we spent a lot of money, it's been a long time, we need solutions. And we understand that and we're working as hard as we can. And we're very excited that NEFA gave us this five-year grant and we're using it to bring national resources together to push scientific solutions to the industry. We're seeing promising results in the field. These are preliminary results. We need to set up more uh, replicated studies in multiple areas and we will be doing that. Um, and we're working with the industry to bring these solutions to the growers. I thank you for staying for the whole time of this talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed the meeting and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys out at some of our field trials as we move this stuff towards commercialization. Take care, have a good day. <laughs>